Hello, Dog Nation. I'm Brandon Adams. This is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Breda Pest Management. We are happy to have you with us. A fun conversation coming up today. Always love looking forward to the future and what's kind of on the horizon here for the uh, dogs. So obviously, we're going to talk about some of that on the show, some of those freshmen who I think could make big impact this year, but also just kind of exciting to have as a part of the program. Uh, we'll do some of that, and I'll tell you specifically why that is for me coming up in just a little bit. Also, what is very likely to be a positive for Georgia this season on the field is probably going to be a little bit more difficult to actually pull off than, than maybe it appears. We're going to talk about why that is off the top there as well. We're on vacation. We're having a good time. And we're enjoying it with all of you and hope you're enjoying it as much as we are as we try to continue to, to deliver some uh, really good pre-recorded shows for you just to make really good use of your time. So thank you so much for being a part of what we're doing here. It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented by Breda Pest Management. And it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Breda Pest Management, the official pest control of UGA Athletics. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. There's one thing for Georgia here for this upcoming season that looks an awful lot like something that may have happened in the past, and I think that might lead you to consider this to be maybe a little bit easier than it actually appears to be. What do I mean by that? Let me kind of explain it this way. Let's go back in time to... One of the main reasons why Georgia won the national championship, I believe, in 2021, not so much the season, but one of the main reasons why it won the national championship game, given some need to improve the offensive line play and sort of reassert itself physically along the line of scrimmage near the end of that game in a way that uh, maybe it had not done prior to that. Uh, the decision was made to kind of move Jamari Sayer back towards the guard position, uh, it bringing into the game Broderick Jones there at offensive tackle, that version of the Georgia offensive line really gelled. They were just physically tougher than Alabama, and that pushed Georgia to that win. It was a great coaching decision, one of those buttons you push during the game that may have been the difference between winning and losing. But for Georgia, it also had the, the, the byproduct as well of being a really nice springboard in the 2022 season, too, because up until that national championship, Broderick Jones had not played a you know, ton of offensive tackle as of yet. He had been a you know, Georgia offensive lineman, but the idea that he was kind of ready to be an offensive tackle, there had been some, I guess, discussion, some wonder if that was really you know something that Jones was quite ready to do. Well, he showed you in the offensive line, or I should say he showed you in the national championship game, that he absolutely was ready to, to do all of that. It was something that he was clearly ready for, and he also kind of really indicated that he was going to be ready to now be kind of a, one of the bedrock members of Georgia's 2022 offensive line. It's kind of a real seminal moment for Georgia along the way towards winning those back-to-back -back national titles, the emergence of Broderick Jones. If you want to go back to last spring, this is what Jones said about that at the time. You know, it was just a surreal feeling being able to play in the national championship game. Like, that's just like a huge dream that any kid that plays on a college level dream for. So it was, I know like I didn't play as much or I didn't start, but I felt like I've gotten better over the past seasons that I've been here, preparing myself and just, you know, being able to step up when my name is called. And that is exactly what Broderick Jones did there that day. He stepped up when his name was called. And that, for him, became the kind of, I think, the start of, of, of a story that kind of propelled itself all the way through the 2022 season where Jones seemingly worked, got better with each passing day, each passing week, each passing game. Uh, by the end of the season, Jones was just simply one of Georgia's most important players. And once again, to hear from Brad in his own words here, the the dedication he put towards finding a way to improve every single moment he had the opportunity to be able to do that we certainly saw this with our own eyes and you know just prior to the start of last season this is how Jones sort of described that that desire to continue to seek improvement and become the best version of himself he could be as a player once again Broderick Jones you no know, it's always a work in progress but I feel like you know I've done enough to 
you know, push myself to be better. You know, I can always be better in any aspect of life. So I just continue, like, every day to push myself in practice, push my teammates to be better, you know. I try not to look at my own, like, individual action at left tackle. I try, mm -hmm. like, you know, it's all about the team. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not trying to, you know, put everything on myself. So I, I'm looking forward to, like, seeing the team get better, seeing the team mm -hmm. progress as a whole. So. So that's Broder Jones talking about that, his desire to improve and the the hope that he had the offensive line can kind of continue to do the same thing. I think they did. We said this on one of our shows, was it going back to what last Friday, about for me, one of the really fun stories this past year for Georgia was the way in which, you know, Stacey Sarrells arrives as offensive line coach prior to last season. Some Georgia fans are maybe not quite so sure about that, to be honest with you. Maybe I wasn't quite so sure what to think about that. But the results obviously speak to them for themselves and sports scoreboard matters and what the Georgia offensive line does last season, a big part of ultimately why this team won the national championship. And as I said, so Jones rises up, becomes a huge player, now transitions out of the program. And for a lot of Georgia fans, they see the kind of reemergence of a very similar kind of story for this upcoming year as well. Because you know, you know, at the end of last season, Warren McClendon was dealing with an injury. Now, McClendon had been a bedrock starter for Georgia along its offensive line, very important right tackle, but, you know, was banged up at the end of last season, was not able to go in a starting role. So who did step in for him as a starter? The former five-star prospect, Demarius Mims. Mims, who Georgia had also held on to last offseason when at one point in time it seemed like Mims might transfer, and it seemed specifically like he might go to Florida State. George is able to hold on to Amarius, keep him from doing that, and ultimately it paid off huge to the tune of stepping in, college ball playoff, national championship, and really being a big part of why Georgia didn't skip a beat along the way towards winning that second straight national championship. And there's this thought that I think exists out there, and you understand where this comes from, of you know Jones was the former elite recruit, emerged in the 2021 college football playoff, used that as a springboard to be one of Georgia's most important players for 2022. Then Amarius Mims, who emerged in last year's college football playoff, likely to now use that as a springboard towards being Georgia's most important offensive lineman. And if I had to be honest with you, I think there's a really good chance that Amarius Mims is actually for this upcoming year just simply put one of the very best players in college football. That's how good I believe that Mims can be. I think it is very likely that what Mims does is pretty similar to what Jones did a year ago. And the recruiting battle that, that Georgia first won to get Amarius Mims and the second recruiting battle that Georgia won to hold on to Mims to keep him from transferring, that ends up being a really important part of why Georgia, uh, a really important part of the story, I should say, for why Georgia is having the success that it's having. But here is where I want to kind of change the tone of the conversation just a little bit. As true as all of this is, what Jones did do, what Mims might do, and the way this story kind of rhymes with that story, as true as all of that is, can we just say openly here for a moment that it is not necessarily that easy for Mims to, to travel down that same path of Broderick Jones, even though it seems likely that he might. And I want to put a finer point on this by really talking to you for a moment here about a big board that I saw online. You know what the big board is? You have the NFL draft coming up and, you know, sometimes you have mock drafts and this guy's going to get drafted here and that guy's get drafted there. But really what NFL teams actually do and is, is rating the individual talents, regardless of position and regardless of who's picking where these are just in the eyes of the, of, of the NFL teams, the very best players available. And a lot of websites will kind of do their own version of the big board as a way of kind of resembling what they think NFL teams might be thinking. And, Every website's got their own version of this. There's a website out there that covers the NFL called The 33rd Team. It's the 33rd teamcom I don't read a lot of NFL media, so I don't really know a ton about this, but someone shared this with me. I thought it was kind of interesting. So if you look at the uh, big board here from the 33rd teamcom let's go top 10 here. Uh, you got Jordan Addison at number 10. That's the USC wide receiver. Up above him at number 9, you got C.J. Stroud, the Ohio State quarterback, Tyree Wilson, uh, uh, from Texas Tech there at uh, at the uh, number eight spot. Bryce Young at number seven, the Alabama quarterback. B. John Robinson, the Texas running back at number six. Then you get to Will Anderson, number five. Will Levis, number four. First of all, let me just say this. If anybody takes Will Levis over Bryce Young or C.J. Stroud, I don't know what we're doing. But nonetheless, that's what the 33rd team there has. They've got Quentin Johnson, the TCU receiver, who was pretty much put in handcuffs against the Georgia defense back in the national championship game. But nonetheless, he's uh, number three 
in this spot here on the big board, according to the 33rd team.com. But saving the best for last, did you know, according to this website that I barely have ever heard of, but some of you apparently know because one of you at least shared it with me, according to the big board at 33rd team.com, the top two players in the NFL draft for this upcoming year, you may not be surprised to find Jalen Carter at number one here on this big board. Few would dispute that. Uh, but how about the fact that at, uh, the 33rd team.com, they've got as the second most draftable player in this upcoming draft, the second player on the big board, Georgia offensive tackle Broderick Jones. Now, I find that'd be pretty interesting. Now, I've certainly heard plenty of chatter about the idea that Jones could be taken in the first round, which we'd obviously celebrate. And I certainly understand why the 33rd team likes Jones this much. Those of us who watch Georgia pretty closely would say that we saw a great player and we saw Jones play this year, one of Georgia's better players. But let's also be honest about this. Offensive line play at times can be occasionally difficult to evaluate. In other words, you know the difference between a great wide receiver and a good wide receiver because the stats are to tell you the story. Same thing with quarterback, same thing with running back. These sort of stats-oriented positions, the difference between great and good is sometimes obvious to us because we got the numbers to sort of prove it one way or another. Offensive line play at times can be a little bit more nuanced than that. Everybody knew that Broderick Jones was a good player, but NFL draft scouts are also telling you, no, actually, he was a great player. And the 33rd team, which maybe you care about, maybe you don't, they've gone so far as to say he's better than anybody else other than Jalen Carter, that the two best dudes in the entire country were battling on lines of scrimmage during practice on the same team. And that's obviously a cool comment to Broderick Jones. But it's also a reminder of, well, if he really is that great or even close to that great, if he's even great enough to be a first-round pick, then how much value did he provide George along the offensive line here this year, and where would Georgia have been without him? We'll never know that. We just know that Georgia had itself a great offensive tackle, and that was part of a component building block to making Georgia also a great offensive line. So the point you're getting to is, and now it's Amarius Mims' turn, and Amarius Mims really could be just like Broderick Jones. Smart-thinking people would say he probably will. But when you see just how much these NFL draft scouts value Jones, it's important to know that even if Amarius Mims marches in the same direction towards the same result at the end of this uh, upcoming season, it is still a little harder to actually accomplish than it sort of sometimes sounds when you sort of describe it uh, here on a show like this. So here's what we believe. We believe that Georgia could be in really good hands with a guy like Mims emerging for the Georgia offensive line in 2023. We also believe that Broderick Jones was probably a little bit better at times than he maybe got credit for, and Marius Mims being as good as Broderick was this past year is a pretty big step forward and a pretty big statement to be able to make. Uh, Georgia holding on to Mims, one of the best things this program has done in recent years, and this year we'll find out, can he travel that, ex same path, that exact same path towards the level of greatness that, that Jones seemed to find? Can Mims travel that himself? Should be a, fir uh, should be a very fun journey to watch him go on. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is uh, Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. We're presented today by Breda Pest Management, and we're happy to have you with us. No matter how you get to us today, live on video, 10 a.m., Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch. We normally start earlier than that, 945, dognation.com, the Dog Nation app. But uh, this week, on vacation, so we're kind of getting started across the board there at 10 a.m. We'll look forward to getting back to our first and 15 with you again next week. Of course, also on the radio at noon on Athens Sports Radio 960, The Ref, and as a podcast, wherever you find them, including the world-famous dognation.com, Apple, Spotify, everything else in between. Just really happy to have you a part of the program, whichever platform you choose to use. And a huge thanks to our friends at Breda Pest Management for making it all possible. You know, Breda Pest Management is the official pest control provider of UGA Athletics. Now, here's what that means. All those great athletic venues on the Athens campus, Breda Pest Management protects them all from termites, from bugs, from critters, from everything else. They provide that level of protect, uh, protection from UGA. Now, if that's huge UGA trust, obviously you know that'd be a great resource for you to trust there as well. And it's that unparalleled strength you know, in business since 1975, 125 different employees. It's that unparalleled strength that Georgia trusts, that UGA respects. It can also benefit you in a very important, tangible way there as well. It can put more money back in your pocket. In fact, when you check them out online, BredaPest.com, that's B-R-E-D-A, BredaPest.com, 
you can actually find out how you can make the switch to Breda Pest Management for your termite protection and put more money back in your pocket instantly just for making that decision. That's how their strength, their resource, their their tradition of great service in the industry can really be benefited for you because they can sort of provide that opportunity for you to save more money when you make the switch. The company you're working with right now, honestly, they're probably sending you that letter each and every year. Cost of service going up. Seems like everything's getting more expensive, but not at Breda Pass Management. They can save you money just for making the switch. So do that today. It's BredaPass.com. B-R-E-D-A, BredaPass.com for a lot more on that. All right, we're going to have a good conversation coming up. On Wednesdays, we typically do. Giving a chance to talk to uh, Dog Nation's Mike Griffith. We'll do that here coming up in just a moment. We're really looking forward to being able to do that. Prior to that, I want to go around the doghouse here for a moment. And I think one of the things that's always really fun about any upcoming season, we're kind of in sort of upcoming season mode here right now uh, because we're not too far away from spring practice. We're just sort of taking that kind of pause now that a lot of the hay is in the barn for the 2022 and the aftermath of coaches and players moving on. Now we can kind of start really sort of fully looking ahead to 2023 and one of the things that's always really fun about that is hey who are the incoming freshmen that might make a big impact because newcomers are just always fun and exciting that's just always a big part of sports when you see something new new player new energy new blood that's always a great thing and so this year georgia with its 2023 recruiting class is probably once again in line to have a contribution from a couple of really impressive young guys and if you want to go back to december when the early signing period concluded smart was kind of asked to you know, how do you evaluate this class? How do you know if you have a good class or not? Because it's from that it's from that class that Georgia seeks a crop of newcomers that might be able to contribute on the field. So how do you know that you even have a good class? How do you judge all of that? And Kirby gave a very Kirby-like answer to that question of what makes a good recruiting class. And from that recruiting class, we're going to try to find some contributors for this season. But first, here's Kirby on how he even judges classes like that. A successful signing day is defined four years from now, you know, I look backwards on that. I don't. I leave it to you guys to rate them because I don't. I, I can't compare somebody else's to ours because I don't really look at somebody else's. I only compare ours to what they do when they leave, not what they do when they arrive. How many of them graduate? How many wins they have? Um, what kind of people they become? How they integrate into our culture is probably the best defining success quality. And uh, hopefully they'll do that well. We'll onboard them well, and uh, you know. I hate to say it, but you know, there's probably not a lot of difference in all these kids being signed. The difference is what you do with them. Um, but people make it about who you sign, not what they become. And uh, I'm a lot more interested in what you know they become. I think that's a really wise and interesting answer from Kirby Smart. I enjoy that. There's a lot that he says that could probably be unpacked. We could probably do conversations about certain facets of that answer and have plenty to say about a lot of that. But I think it also kind of sets the stage for hey you bring in good raw talent now you got to develop them you got to do something with them smart says that kind of at the end there and obviously on the defensive side of the ball that's where georgia's been stellar now for quite some time and when i think about this 2023 recruiting class i do think a little bit about defense you know which of the incoming signees which of the the incoming freshmen am i probably the most excited about for this upcoming season i think for me at least right now a lot of that is on defense and I'm reminded of what I said, not that I get every prediction right, because gosh knows I don't, but a prediction that I believe eventually I will be proven right on. And I said this right after the 2021 season, that the ultimate legacy of the Georgia defense from that year, it was historic, it was dominant, it was entertaining, it was, I mean, it was just such a joy to see that kind of defensive destruction week in, week out over the tune of a 15-game national championship season it was just an unbelievable thing to see and what I said in the immediate aftermath of that national championship that I believe that the ultimate legacy for the 2021 defense is eventually the brand recognition that brought Georgia would eventually create a defense at UGA sometime in the future that's even better that when people kind of recognized oh Georgia is the clear undisputed market leader defensively eventually that's going to cause other great players to want to kind of fall in line and say hey I want to be the next Trayvon Walker I want to be the next Nicobe Dean I want to be the next 
you know, Lewis Seen. I want to be the next Jordan Davis. On and on you could go with those, you know, those guys, Quay Walker, Devontae White, just start mentioning to mention them all here. I I see the archetype. I see the proof of concept, and I want to be that next guy. And eventually, because of that success, both collectively and individually, the Jordan would have a better defense eventually. Now, I don't know that it happens in 2023. I'm not here to tell you that the 2023 defense was going to be better than the 2021 defense. If I thought that, I'd be starting to show with it. We would make a nice headline around it and everything else. Uh, So I don't know that I'm quite ready to say that. But I still feel pretty confident that eventually Georgia will have a better defense than it had in 2021 because this is the place where great defenders want to play. And I think this 2023 recruiting class is a little bit of a nod in that direction. How much of these guys we see this year, who knows? Who knows? But the freshman that I'm kind of the most excited to see, Damon Wilson's on that list for me, the five-star edge rusher. I believe he will have a chance to contribute this year, and I believe he has a chance to go on to be quite special. And that's a part of what Georgia could look like in a huge way in the future, but you could see some of that right now. That, to me, is one of my most exciting freshmen. The collection of linebackers, inside-type linebackers that Georgia brought in this year, the Raylan Wilsons, the Troy Bowles, the C.J. Allens. By the way, Allens already earned a lot of praise for what he did during bowl practice and things like that. If we're saying that eventually Georgia has a better defense sometime in the future than even the historic 2021 defense, that collection of linebackers, part of the way in which you maybe get there, and we may see some of those guys on the field here this upcoming season. I'd say Janelle Aguero is a little bit like that too. That's another one of those guys that, hey, you know, Georgia this past year, they trusted Malachi Starks with good reason, and they put him on the field and let him play a lot, and he kind of grew into a pretty big role because of that. You know, who's to say that Aguero might not get some chance to do some of that same kind of stuff here for this upcoming season, too? And then along the defensive line, you know, guys like Jamal Jarrett, who sort of feels like the next Jordan Davis, even though that's kind of an unfair label to put on somebody. Guys like Jordan Hall, who might be kind of the next Devontae White, even though that's also kind of an unfair label to sort of, you know, put on somebody. But but you're talking about, oh, one day you're even better defensively than you were way back in 2021 when you had the uh, the historic, unprecedented level of defensive dominance. Well, seeing some of that from those guys this year, by the way, because Bear Alexander, by the end of the season, was a freshman defensive lineman because defensive tackle in the SEC, not typically a spot we think you know freshmen necessarily thrive at, but Bear was certainly doing a great job for you in the national championship game. And guys like Hall and uh, Jarrett, they may have their chance to do that there at some point in time too. The overall you know, bottom line of the discussion is, is there's a lot to be excited about and be interested in when it comes to the 2023 class for Georgia. Offensive names you certainly could mention, but for whatever reason, my focus was on defense. My interest is on defense because eventually Georgia may have a defense sometime in the future, whether it happens this year or 2024 whenever else, where you really do say, wow, to a level that maybe is even beyond what you said in 2021. And the seeds for how you get there, they may be planted by some of the freshmen who play here for this upcoming season. That is around the doghouse. And by the way, speaking of planting and growing things and things like that, that's obviously uh, the story that gets you to the great coffee that we uh, talk about from time to time. You've heard us talk about Jittery Joe's before. Well, the cool thing about Jittery Joe's right now is the uh, delicious coffee they're famous for, the Arabica beans uh, coming from that great region of the world that makes such great coffee. In addition to that great Jittery Joe's coffee, right now you also get a chance to enjoy that in this special collector's commemorative tin celebrating Georgia's back-to-back national championships. This is a partnership between Jittery Joe's and UGA to acknowledge and celebrate back-to-back national championships. And inside the uh, special tin here that's got the Power G on the top and the back-to-back logo right here, and then kind of a little bit of a story of George on the back, all the great scores in the games. Inside that, the delicious coffee coffee that Jittery Joe's is famous for. So check them out online, jitteryjoes.com. That's J-I-T-T-E-R-Y, jitteryjoes.com. You can get some great coffee and you enjoy this unbelievably cool collector's tin here celebrating the uh, and commemorating the back-to-back national championships for UGA, our friends at Jittery Joe's, making that possible. All right, before we're done, Closer look, some of the teams in the SEC, big questions facing league foes for the dogs. We'll address some of that. But for now, on everything else happening around UGA, always fun on a Wednesday to catch up with Dog Nation's Mike Griffith. So let's do that right now here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pest Management. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. And here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pest Manager, great to get a chance to talk to Mike Griffith today, especially kind enough to give us some time here on what is a pre-recorded 
addition for us because of my uh, vacation. So I appreciate Mike on that. Also, one of these weird things where we're talking about something that just happened that our audience has had kind of a week to digest. But obviously, it's still big news. Even a week later, the fact that, you know, Todd Munkin, as folks are well aware, moved on to the Baltimore Ravens, now offensive coordinator, Mike Bobo, they're the replacement uh mike griffith uh dog fans have had several days kind of sort of process that figure out what it means everyone's got opinions obviously bobo a a, a very well-known figure here a long time connection to uga long time connection to kirby smart for you though this is a little bit fresher a little bit newer for you because uh, we're recording this really just a matter of minutes after it happened so for our audience you know what are your thoughts on this new era for for georgia offensively well, Brandon, I mean, I think we've all known for quite some time that, that Todd Munkin might be leaving Georgia, and certainly Kirby Smart knew that. And as we all know about Kirby, there's always a plan. So I think this was in place for a long time. I think Bobo's been in the on-deck circle for a while, and Kirby probably figured that Munkin was going. When he takes second interviews with places and he doesn't really settle in, and as Jake Prom said on Dog Nation Daily a couple of weeks ago, uh, hey, these kids need to know the playbook. Let's get this going. You know, Jake Jake understood the position these young quarterbacks were in, and whoever it's going to be, give them the opportunity to start getting to work. So I think there's probably, um, you know, now uh, when people hear this, it'll be a weekend. There's probably a sense of relief, a re- relief and, and a calmness has probably settled in that, okay, this is the direction that Georgia football is going for sure. Now you know for sure. Kind of thought, yeah, you know, Bobo, now you know. So I, I think that they'll be settled. I think the plans will be in you know good shape for the spring. And I don't I don't think it's this, this is going to sound crazy, but I don't think it's as big of a deal as a lot of people are going to try to make it. Uh, tell me more about why you think it's less of a big deal than some people try to make it. Because to a lot of fans, it is obviously a very big deal. Why is it less significant to you, maybe? Well, like Stetson Bennett said at the victory celebration. It ain't the X's and the O's, it's the Jimmy's and the Joe's. And, you know, I posted a story last week right after the news broke with some of Jake Fromm's comments from Dog Nation as well as some of Jim Donnan uh, on a podcast that UJ Sports did. Jim Donnan said, hey, I'm not worried about this. Donnan says, look, Georgia's the last two years, Georgia's has more talent than every team they've played except for maybe Alabama and Ohio State might have been close to even. So basically what he was saying was, you know, when you've got more talent than the other team, I mean, yes, of course, Todd Munkin was an ingenious play caller and, and he played chestnut checkers and was three moves ahead, but he also had better players. I mean, how much of it was Todd Munkin's play call versus Kenny McIntosh, Lad McConkey, or Brad ba- Brock Bowers, you know, breaking tackles and running away from people? So, you know, it almost seemed like the way it was set up, as long as Stetson made the right decisions, and players were able to block and execute. I mean, you, you could have the best play call in the world, but if you don't have players uh, that are able to throw the passes on time or accurately or players that can block, your, your play calls don't matter. And, and you know, Georgia's had players. I mean, Broderick Jones was a, you know, a stalwart left tackle, didn't give up any sacks. And Kenny McIntosh, uh, the most versatile back in, in Georgia history, when you look at the receiving and rushing yards, one of only three players in the SEC since uh, 2000 with 800 uh, you know yards rushing and 500 receiving and 10 touchdowns. Uh, Brock Bowers, to me, arguably the greatest tight end of the modern era. When you look at uh, his consistency, his versatility, his playmaking. Um, and then, of course, you know, Stetson brought you some mobility and some clutch play. Uh, and then you had this pillar of, a, of defense that's been among the best in the country the last three or four years. Um, legendary in 2021. So, yeah, Todd Munkin was a piece of that. But, but you know, to me in 2021, it wasn't about Todd Munkin. It's about the defense. This year, I think Todd did some great things uh, with Stetson and building the offense around his strength. Um, you know, but, but there were times it didn't look too good. I mean, 17 points against Kentucky. I, I don't know about you. I wasn't too excited. I think they were shut out halfway through the second quarter against Georgia Tech. I, you know, so – my point is, I, I think Munkin is fantastic. I think he's the best offensive coordinator that, that I've covered personally. But because of George's talent, because Mike, because you have Mike Bobo as a replacement, um, who I think is an outstanding coordinator, and who already knows the system and the verbiage, 
I, that's why I think it's an easier transition. And then because of Georgia's schedule, let's be honest. Um, who scares you next year? Mm-hmm. Brandon, I think you could call plays. No offense. And, and, and they might be undefeated through October. <laughs> Listen, that's my dream come true to get a chance to uh, get out there and call some plays. Well, speaking of transition, it's also a transition for Georgia number of ways there as well. Another elite recruiting class welcoming in another impressive crop of freshmen. One of the things we talked about on today's show before you joined us, some of those freshmen that Georgia fans maybe ought to be the most excited about. You know, Mike, obviously we're still well ahead of spring practice here. Is there a freshman or two that you think may have a chance to sort of step in, make an immediate impact on this Georgia roster right now? Um, you know, I've got some curiosities about the running back. I'm, I'm, you know, I know that, um, I know that Del McGee talked big things about him, uh, when they had the, the booster meeting with, I believe, the McGill Society last month, yeah. Brandon. Um, so I, I suppose the Robinson kid is, is a kid that I'm curious, like, and I know, and, and listen, I'm as much of a sucker as anybody for the freshman running back because it's a position where you can make an impact. But this guy, this guy sounds cut a little different, and, and I don't know how much opportunity is going to be there because I think Kendall and Dejon are, are a big-time one-two punch. We'll see what, what Branson does um, and, and, and how Andrew comes back from his injury. But I, I'm curious to see um, you know, what the running – and then really all three of the receivers. Look, there's going to be opportunities here because and, – and, and I'm a big Delp guy. I'm a big Oscar Delp guy, but it's not like he's going to step into Darnell Washington's shoes. Nobody's going to step into Darnell's shoes. Nobody is going to be able to do for this offense what Darnell did. 280 pounds is 280 pounds. Now, Delp to me looks like you know, uh, you know, the next coming of Brock Bowers, which is pretty fantastic. But it's not the same as having an extra offensive tackle on the field who can also catch passes. So that said, where I'm getting getting to with this long-winded introduction to others is, I think we're going to see more multi-receiver formations. And so I think you're going to see more guys out of the slot. Obviously, the incoming transfers love it. And Ra Ra Thomas, I think, you know, I know you're talking about freshmen, but sure. when, when we talk about newcomers, I would include them. I think they're going to be integral. You know, they were the returning leading receivers at their respective schools um, at Mississippi State and, and uh, Missouri. So I think these guys are going to be immediate impact. Probably the most important newcomers will be those two transfer receivers. And then the incoming receivers – had a chance to practice with the team during the bowl. Heard good things about all of them. Hmm. Uh, but quite frankly, on the side, Munkin was telling people that none of them um, were going to have the sort of impact that Ra Ra Thomas could have just because of his experience. So um, that said, it's going to be a, you know, a, a different offense anyway. Um, whether or not Munkin was coming back, there was going to be a new offense. Um, I'm curious to see how the quarterbacks work out you know to me this kind of scrambles the, the competition and if anybody's yeah. pissed it's probably Carson Beck because he's on deck he knows the Munkin system he's waited three years to play for Munkin and now Munkin's out of here and in the competition is kind of like okay Mike Boba comes in you guys got to sleep clean slate you know if so if you're if you're back I mean my goodness just how many times has that poor kid had to look back at the bad practice that he had the week of the UAB game I mean, what is the script? If, what is the script, Brandon? If Carson Beck starts against UAB and he's the one that throws five touchdowns, sure, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, what if scenario there? And obviously, that quarterback competition going to be uh, remarkably compelling come spring with a new offensive coordinator at the, at the helm to kind of make those decisions. All right, Mike, I want to finish with this and. We've been we've been kind of doing this a little bit with our guests this week. We'll do this again with you tomorrow in some form or fashion there too. Something I haven't really done for some of my vacation shows in the past. We're kind of doing sort of a dog nation survey here a little bit where I'm getting the same thought from from a handful of obviously our dog nation daily audience getting a chance to wait on this, but also you, Connor and uh, Jeff there as well. And part of the motivation for this is something that you and I talked about a couple of weeks ago on the show when we were talking about memories of the 2022 season, the Georgia-Tennessee game or whatever else. So here's what I kind of want to ask you, Mike. A, and, and you've kind of, as I said, kind of already given me this a little bit, but let me start with this. When you look back on this 2022 season for Georgia, what is the number one memory for you of the 15-0 and back-to-back season? Wow. The number one memory for me uh, – um... Well, that's tough. There's, there's so many, there's so many moments. I think about the Ohio State missed field goal, um, and you know, as the clock was striking midnight, yeah. and uh, you know, me and you doing the little high five there yeah. uh, in the in the press box. That was a kind of a cool moment. I think about, you know, I think I said Stetson Bennett's plays. 
Yeah, you last um, a couple of weeks ago, you were talking about the uh, the game against Tennessee kind of standing out. For yeah, you more it, than I, that was big. You know, that was big. That that was certainly a big moment. I, I'll tell you what. I mean, one of the things I thought about was just just that Oregon game. I mean, it was just like, holy cow! I mean, we knew these guys were going to be good, but it was like, you got to be kidding me! Yeah. I mean, it's you walking out of there and it's forty nine to three. I'm just, you know, and I'm just like, jeez. These guys, this is unbelievable, you know. Um, I guess I think about, I think about Mike Leach and his post game sure. talking about Georgia, how he was kind of ticked off. He thought a couple calls went against him, and of course we lost Coach Leach. But I sure appreciated how competitive he was. And in Mississippi State, you know, being competitive for a half, that was tough. I, I give those Bulldogs credit; they were they were undefeated at home going into that. And, uh, you know, they kind of pulled a fast one there, um, you know, <laughs> getting that touchdown right before halftime, and you're going, wait a minute, this game shouldn't be this close. So I, you know, I think about that. I think about I think about the Kenny McIntosh fourth and two run against Missouri when I'm looking at the clock and I'm thinking, man, if he doesn't make this fourth and two, they, they're in trouble. <laughs> so, they, you know, remember the fourth and two call? They call timeout, and you're like, what's Munkin going to dial up? Who are they going to go to? They, and they go to Kenny McIntosh on the fourth, and he breaks the tackle. I think mm-hmm. a guy hit him behind the line, and you know somehow Missouri. And actually, I got a story to write about that still about one of the Missouri defensive linemen talking about how they got ticked off by uh, Jalen Carter, you know, pregame stroll through the end zone. But that Missouri team. So, gosh, Brandon, you're, you're giving me all these. I've got all these vibes and sure. feelings and memories, and uh, you know. I, I, I don't know if I can limit it to just one. I don't know the one that's going to have staying. I'm still trying to wrap my brain around, you know, 2021, I guess. And, and Well, that's you know, kind of the was, thing. If, the so rest- if you combine both seasons together, is there – so it's a back-to-back run for Georgia, 29-1 on the field. If you combine both seasons together, like what is the most indelible moment of the two seasons? If you, if you get a chance to put them both in the same pot, is there one that stands out above the rest for the last two seasons? Obviously, back to back national championship years. Oh man, that's uh, you, you know what? I'll, I'll give it to you. Okay, the Chris Smith pick six. It's it, it, if he doesn't make that play, I don't know what this conversation is right now. I don't know if there's one, much less two. Interesting. Interesting. I'm going to say it's the Chris Smith pick six. That's Against the play. Clemson, the if very you first. Wanna, if you want to build a statue in front of Sanford Stadium. I want I want Chris Smith on the pick six because he's a two time you know All American player um, comes up with all these intangible plays. He's from Atlanta. He's a story of what Georgia football is all about. A guy that was waiting his turn, didn't transfer out, waited his turn. Richie LeCount goes down unexpectedly. Chris steps in twenty twenty, just gets better and better. Um, plays that DB position under Kirby, which I think is the hardest position on the team to play because the way Kirby wears those guys out. And just the way Soldier Chris grew up and the representative that he is of Atlanta and Georgia, and that pick six, I'm going to say the Clemson pick six is the play from the last two years that will stay with me. Mike, good stuff. Thanks for your time today. We'll come back. We'll do a few more minutes with you tomorrow. We appreciate it. You got to be A. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Always fun to get a chance to talk to Mike Griffith here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Braden Pass Manager today. In fact, it's so much fun. We'll get a chance to do that again tomorrow there, too. So appreciate Mike's time. Appreciate all of you being here there as well. You know, we take it seriously that when we can't be here and we have to do the pre recorded episodes, that we want to try to make them good for you. That's one of those things we don't want to mail it in. We don't want to kind of just sort of just, you know, you know, we want to make the shows as good as we possibly can. Obviously, there's always the chance that that some sort of news breaks and you know prevents us uh, from being as timely as we otherwise could have been. But in this case, we probably caught a break because last week, you know, as we were getting ready to sort of start our pre-records, the Mike Bobo hire, the Todd Munkin moving on, all of that kind of goes down and, uh, and and takes place and happens. So, you know, from that standpoint, one of the things I sort of thought might happen while we were gone, we actually get that out of the way before we leave. So kind of sets the stage for us to sort of, you know, have a little bit of vacation time, sneak away for a week, but also give you some good content. So hopefully we're able to do that for you. We certainly appreciate all of you being here. In fact, we'll continue the little bit of an ongoing series looking at the head of the SEC. We'll do that here in a moment. Before that, though, let's tell you what we're doing right now, which is cruise around the SEC. Courtesy of Royal Caribbean, obviously I'm loving the fact that I'm right now on board Wonder of the Seas, largest cruise ship in the world, having a great time 
on that Royal Caribbean cruise vacation. What I love about Royal Caribbean, too, especially for those of us going to live in this area, you know, Florida's not difficult to get to, short drive to Port Canaveral or, you know, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, whichever port you want to go out of. You have all of the various cruise options. You know, you can do the three-night option, which kind of takes place over the course of a weekend, sailing on Friday, coming back on Monday. The four-night option, which gives you a little bit of a shorter type thing if you can't kind of be away uh, for the full seven days. But sometimes you just sort of need the seven-day cruise, and that's what we're on right now. And, you know, my wife and I, I can tell you, we both just sort of felt like, hey, listen, uh, not, there's never an easy time to get away. There's always all kinds of considerations about whether or not you – uh you know, could do this, should do this, whatever else. But eventually you just sort of left to conclude, hey, we need a vacation. It is time for us to go. And so that's what we're doing here right now. And we're grateful for that opportunity. And I hope you get a chance to enjoy that too with your family, friends, those of you, uh, those people that you care about in your life. So hopefully you get a chance to do that very same thing. And if you're thinking about, well, maybe it's time for you to book that Royal Caribbean Cruise vacation. Jessica Slater, terrific travel agent, terrific person uh, to be able to help you out with that. In fact, she was specially selected for us by Royal Caribbean to be able to get this done. So you can give her a call, 770-718-9147, 770-718-9147. She's my personal travel agent. My wife's on the phone with her a lot. They're talking about things for our cruise and getting planned for this and question about that. And Jessica's always so attentive and so great about handling all those things, and she do that for you there too. You can also find her online, royaldogs.com, a website that she's put together specifically for the Dog Nation cruise we have coming up in April, royaldogs.com, for more information on all of that. All right, with that said, cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean, what we've been doing here is is we've been looking at um, a big question for each SEC team. And this is basically just sort of a device for us to sort of set the stage. It's kind of a pre-spring preview. I'm sure we'll come back into an actual spring preview at some point in time, but it's sort of our pre-spring preview. We're kind of post-signing day before spring, Transfer portal is closed. Here is kind of the, the the capsule, if you will, about where it stands for the various SEC teams. And I want to pick up today with the Missouri Tigers here for a moment. Now, Missouri is one of those teams that for the most part kind of exists off your radar in most years. But this past year, it stood as Georgia's toughest game. So I guess they at least had to be a little bit on your radar for this upcoming year, although you would certainly would expect uh, lightning to strike twice in terms of Missouri staying with Georgia for 60 minutes. But nonetheless, if you have a tendency to want to kind of ignore or disregard Missouri, the way they played against Georgia last year would maybe prevent you from wanting to do that maybe at least a little bit. And one of the things we saw from Missouri a lot last year was, hey, they had a chance to maybe win more games than they did because defensively they really weren't a bad football team. They had a chance to maybe win more games than they did, had some talent in the wide receiver position. Of course, one of those guys now is at Georgia. But nonetheless, this was not a Missouri team that had – you know, a lack of things necessarily going for it. You know, I told you before, some wide receiver talent, pretty good defensively. But the one thing they did not have is Missouri just did not have a quarterback. And I think one of the transfers we probably haven't talked enough about is Jake Garcia leaving Miami to go to Missouri. Now, I don't ultimately know how good Garcia is going to be, but I do know this. When Garcia moved to the state of Georgia for a senior year of high school, treated is a very big deal. And it kind of bounced around a couple of schools. There was a lot of attention being paid to that. But part of the reason there was so much attention being paid to that is because Garcia was uh, a really a pretty big time prospect. And so after having been at Miami and like a lot of people, it doesn't really quite work out for him there. We're not really quite so sure what's going on in Miami, but it doesn't seem like they're building towards much here at this uh, particular moment. But after after having that not work out quite so well on the move, landing at Missouri and you got a guy like Luther Burden, who I think a lot of folks wonder, well, is Burden going to leave that program? This is the former five-star receiver. And during the offseason, he has seemingly reaffirmed his pledge there to the Tigers. So Burden's going to still be there, maybe getting some NIL for uh, for his efforts in terms of staying there with the program. Imagine what you can do. Now, Dominic Lovett's leaving to come to Georgia, and, and Lovett actually had a more productive year last season than Burden did. But nonetheless, Burden's the former five-star. And you think, well, he could do even bigger things if he had a quarterback to throw to him, and maybe Garcia proves to, to, to be that guy. I think that that the presence of a quarterback like Garcia at least makes Missouri a more interesting team. Honestly, the SEC is a little bit better than it has been, a little bit deeper in what is the final year of this particular division. And so I don't really know where all the opportunities exist for Missouri wins, but having a better quarterback certainly helps, and we'll see if that is indeed the case. Staying in the SEC East here for the moment. The big question for me that it surrounds Vanderbilt, although to Vanderbilt's credit, 
they actually proved by the end of last season to be a better team under Clark Lee than almost anyone thought they could be, and almost anyone would have ever said they have any right to be. Uh, Vanderbilt kind of collected some wins, and Clark Lee, who back in July had said they were working on making Vanderbilt the premier program in the SEC or whatever it was that he said, well, as laughable as that statement is, it at least seemed like slightly less laughable after you win a couple of conference games, which uh, obviously Vanderbilt was able to do this year. But that said, even with a couple of conference wins, this remains, and as far into the future as any of us can see, will continue to remain, the worst program in the SEC. So as the league looks to move into a new scheduling model in 2024, where the SEC East teams won't all play each other the way they have in the past, the big question is, and there's a lot of greedy eyes looking in on this, who is it that gets a chance to play Vanderbilt? Who draws that straw? Who gets a chance to have the Vanderbilt Commodores on their schedule every year? Because that becomes a little bit easier win. And listen, when we look at the one side of the schedule conversation, we sort of look at the front end of all this, of who are the biggest teams and what will be the biggest games and which rivalries can be preserved, which new rivalries might be created, how much of that exists in the SEC. And that's the fun part of the conversation. But there is also a practical reality that exists on the other side of that discussion, which is, SEC wins are really hard to come by, and a lot of programs who've gotten used to maybe being in bowls because they've been able to kind of collect four non-conference wins in a lot of years in future seasons, they may only play three non-conference games. So to be a a, a bowl team, you're going to have to find an extra SEC win somewhere, and it gets tougher with the more balanced schedule. So for the teams that, that, you know, are bad more years than not, there's obviously going to be a lot of value being seen in playing those teams. And Vanderbilt's the best example of that. So we would assume that Tennessee gets Vanderbilt on a yearly basis because that's its in-state rival. And the thought is you probably kind of preserve that a little bit. But, you know, Tennessee also has a chance to claim rivalry with Kentucky. Kentucky certainly sees Tennessee as a rivalry. Now, they also play probably Alabama every year too. So so it's it's not all peaches and cream for uh, Tennessee. But, but you know, the Vols could be one of those teams that gets at least a couple of those SEC teams that, you know, Kentucky's never been to an SEC Conference Championship game. Uh, Vanderbilt's obviously never been there. And, and, and Tennessee may get two of those of its permanent three opponents if that's indeed the scheduling model that the SEC goes to. But you better believe that as much as there's chatter that exists out there about, you know, the big games and the fun rivalries and the marquee matchups, some of this conversation is also going to be about – Hey, who gets the guaranteed win? Who gets the easy win? Vanderbilt usually provides that, and we'll see in the future who earns the right to play the the the, the Commodores each and every year. And then I'll finally uh, finish with this, one more kind of big question facing an SEC team. This is one of those deals where I have to confess that I'm not really objective on this topic because I really, really like Sam Pittman, and I have probably rooted for Arkansas in the Sam Pittman era more than I've ever rooted for any SEC team other than Georgia just because – Pittman brought a lot to UGA, comes across as a great dude. And, you know, I really enjoyed when Pittman was better than most folks thought he would be in 2020. And then again, in 2021, I really enjoyed that. I think reality struck a little bit in 2022. And now as you head towards 2023, all of a sudden Sam Pittman finds himself needing to replace both his coordinators. You know, Barry Odom is the UNLV head coach now. Uh, Kendall Bryles, maybe somewhat surprisingly, went to TCU and now for for Arkansas, you've got two new coordinators in place. The time in which last season, I would say, for the Hogs, wins kind of proved tough to come by. And, you know, Pittman's kind of a favorite son type figure there with the uh, with the Arkansas program. That's that that's something that, you know, he's he's their guy. He loves that state. He loves the University of Arkansas. And that has really served him well for the first couple of years. But unfortunately, this is the SEC, and eventually He's going to be judged, like any other coach is, about how many games you win. And here's what we know. The expectations aren't realistic. Is Pittman winning enough based on realistic expectations? I'd say thus far he has been. And maybe in 2023 he will continue to do that too. But SEC fan bases, their standards aren't built on realistic expectations or even reality there at all. It's based on the idea of, well, if LSU can do it, why can't we? If Georgia can do it, why can't we? If Alabama can do it, why can't we? And there may be very obvious, real, intangible answers to those questions, but it doesn't stop uh, fan bases like Arkansas from continuing to ask them. So when we think about guys who are starting to feel a little more pressure to win a little bit more, fair or not, 
I do think that Sam Pittman needs to be on that list. And listen, I'll be openly cheering for him to win those games. But the challenge gets a little bit more significant in Arkansas right now, knowing that he's got to replace both coordinators, something that he had not really had to do after his uh, first uh, three seasons there on the job. So interesting transition time there at Arkansas. We'll see how Pittman responds to that. And we will make this cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. So we'll continue to do this with our SEC through tomorrow there as well. A couple more SEC teams we want to look at. So we'll set the stage for the rest of the league and we'll also uh, continue to have some fun with some of our other dog nation related content there as well including getting back to our golden shoes by the way next week too so a lot going on we're just glad to have you be a part of what we're doing here over the course of this week so much fun there on that so golden shoes coming up next week fun show for us again tomorrow now as we conclude today's show there's one more piece of business to take care of and that is our gator hater countdown we believe that a true georgia fan is a gator hater first and foremost you can hate whoever you want but you gotta hate florida we think that's job one as a Georgia fan, because they are truly the lousy, stinking Gators. And 248 days from right now, they've got some more bad news coming their way, because Georgia's coming to Jacksonville with bad intentions on its mind to beat up on Florida and uh, keep this our rivalry exactly where it's supposed to be with the dogs on top. You'll have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Past Management. And on video, time now for the R.S. Andrews Cooldown. R.S. Andrews, the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised. The price is promised. You can trust R.S. Andrews on all of that today. So just a few more pre-recorded shows for us. We'll be back in our normal spot there on Monday. At that point in time, we'll take all your comments about everything that's going on. Hopefully we're not missing too much. Now that the Bobo Munkin thing is over, kind of maybe stabilizing things here a little bit. Uh, so hopefully we haven't missed any real big story. But if we do, just keep this in mind. Somebody from Dog Nation will go live. They'll talk about it, and obviously I'll look forward to hitting that with you back again the following Monday when I'm kind of back in the saddle there again on that. But either way, we just appreciate you being here, and my uh, earnest wish is to get check out R.S. Andrews online for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. By the way, I'm enjoying the sunshine in the Caribbean, but it's also a reminder that spring weather, you know, actually warming temperatures, not too far away maybe, so maybe not too soon to go ahead and start thinking about getting that air conditioning system ready for the uh, warm weather season. Spring, summer, it'll be here before you know it. So trust R.S. Andrews on all of that, y'all. And you can find them online, rsandrews.com. Have a great, great day. See you back here tomorrow, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pass Management. We will look forward to talking to you then.